So good morning to everybody on the East Coast of the U.S. I don't know, maybe there are people from other time zones in the U.S. or, or Canada. And uh, good evening from here in Europe, where we are also crossing a couple of time zones. Um, and I'd like to say welcome to our session today. Uh, I'd just like to make a little bit of housekeeping before we start. And the first thing is, is if, if you do want to interact with any of our panelists, uh, I'd encourage you that we have the chat window. I know it's a very standard way of doing it, but uh, the chat window is one way that we can interact. Um, feed in your questions as they come to you. I will try and pay attention to that window and make sure that what you have to say or what question you might have gets into our conversation. Uh, and the second part of the housekeeping is to apologize. I have a little bit of a cough. It is not COVID related. Uh, who knew that you could actually have a cough without having COVID, but it's true, but I have lots of candies. So if you hear me sucking on a candy, you understand why. So um, what I'd like to do now and how we're going to organize this session is I'm going to give just, I'm going to talk for only two minutes maximum, uh, one minute to just introduce what we're here to talk about with a, with a short story, and then to introduce our speakers and panelists here today that will be uh, basically just engaged in a conversation. We're looking to have something really, really dynamic, really interesting, something, you know, not just sitting there and, oh, here's another presentation and here's another presentation that, you know, we'll, we'll have something interesting to say, sit back on the couch, put your headphones on, drink a cup of coffee and enjoy, because I can tell you right now, all of the speakers that are here today, I've had a chance to talk to them and they're all fascinating people. Now, uh, a short introduction. So we're given that we're here to talk about targeting individuals, targeting users, targeting developers with open data, I thought, well, let me start off by seeing what happens in the United States, because most of our panelists and speakers and myself included are, are based in Europe. And so I thought, oh, let's go to the, the American panel, because we all know that the New York, uh, the New York portal, sorry, the portal of the panel, that the New York portal is brilliant. So let's go to the American one and, and see what is happening and compare it. And so I went to data.gov and there's this lovely map, lots of pins on it. And it told me that I could have access to 343,301 data sets. And I said, wow, that's a lot of data. So I was like, okay, I don't even know where to start with that. So let me, let me, let me do a quick search. Electric vehicles, I'm doing a lot about that right now. So I type in the search term and I get 5,301 data sets. And one of those data sets on the first page was, and I quote, the performance enhancement of de-icing systems with the use of anti-ice nano coating phase one. Not phase two, not phase three, not all of the phases. We only get the data from phase one. And it was from NASA, which... I didn't know they did anything with electric vehicles, but to me, this was an interesting uh, point and it really struck home in terms of what we're here to talk about today. And to me, it's this idea of the problem of findability and this idea that we collect open data and it's already a, a, a good thing to just open it to developers, to users, and we put it out there and people will find it and they will use it. But we're at a stage in, in, in data collection and in data distribution where there's so much data out there that there is an open question in my mind about how easy it is to find and how easy it is to exploit. And that's, that's really what we're here to talk about today is, you know, at the end of the day, when we think about that way of distributing data, of talking about data, you know, how do we deal with that? Should we target more? Should we... Uh, organize the data? Should we make decisions about what data we even want to collect? Or should we continue to be relatively agnostic, say that, no, no, more data is better, and then we just need better algorithms, or we need artificial intelligence to sort through all of this information? So these are some of the questions that I, I think that we'll, we'll end up uh, addressing today in our discussion. So now, before we move on to the panel discussion, as I'd mentioned, I just want to introduce uh, very quickly our, our speakers, uh, and then also we're going to have a, a short presentation um, from one of our speakers about data.europa.eu, 
which is the uh, the, the Europe's data portal. Um, so let me introduce everybody, and then I'm going to end up passing the floor on before we come back and, and start our panel session. So uh, our one of our the speaker that will talk about data.europa.eu is Els Breitstraat. She's the head of Open Data Innovation and Outreach, at the publication office of the European Union. And she's going to introduce this portal, specifically talking about uh, its unique position in the European open data community. Because I think this is one of the interesting issues that we might end up discussing today is sort of the, the way that the ecosystem and the way that the community develops. Um, and data.europa.eu uh, data has a very unique position in this regard. So in addition to in inviting her to speak, we also have uh, speakers from, or panelists, I should say, from three different beautiful European cities, which I would highly recommend you all visit because we've selected from the best cities of Europe uh, so that you can visit the great cities and also talk to the uh, individuals about open data because they, they are leaders in terms of open data. Uh, so our first city is Dublin, and we have Luke Bins, who is the project coordinator for Smart Dublin, an initiative of Dublin's four local authorities with responsibility for uh, Dublin's open data portal. Uh, we have the city of Prague, also very beautiful, nice place to go and have a beer, I can recommend. And we have uh, Benedict Kotmail. He's the head of uh, the data platform department for operator ICT, which services the city of Prague uh, when it comes to ICT service, smart cities, uh, many different issues. And finally, we have the city of Paris represented, Diana, or Diana, sorry. We discussed whether I should say Diana or Diana, but we decided on Diana, given our audience. Uh, Filipova, who is uh, actually not yet in the program. I apologize for that. Uh, we will add her to the program, but she is a special advisor to the mayor of Paris when it comes to uh, data issues. And then our last panelist uh, joining us, uh, so I'm based out of the Netherlands, so we like to call it New Amsterdam, but you know it is New York City. Uh, so I'd like to also thank Zachary Fetter for joining us and, and joining the panel to give us a, a bit of a non-European flavor and also some additional thoughts on terms of, of this targeting. So again, we invite you to relax. I'm going to pass the floor on now to Els. Uh, to give you uh, a little bit of an introduction in terms of how we think about open data in Europe through the portal data.europa.eu. Els, I will pass it to you and you can share your screen. Thanks a lot, David. Thanks for the introduction and also a big thank you to the uh, Open Data Week for inviting us uh, to present briefly our project. And uh, David put the barriers high that we are fascinating and that we will not give boring presentations. So as I'm not fascinating, but hopefully have just something small, interesting to share, I will give uh, you five minutes insights in the European Open Data Portal. So to get us maybe to start with, all on the same um, starting line. Uh, is anyone of you not familiar with the concept of open data? Uh, if not, you can raise your hand. Don't be shy. They had to explain it to me like 50 times. Uh, so I cannot see any hands raised. So David, if you can give me a warning. Uh, I think you're good. I don't see any hands raised. Okay, either. perfect. That uh, makes things even simpler. Uh, so with this, then I propose to immediately leave the boring presentation. Um, and instead, give a little hands-on show, uh, let's say, on the, on the website itself. Sorry for this moving around. Like that. Do you see data that you offer? Good. Thanks a lot. Uh, so there we go. So this is already the homepage of uh, data that you as um, uh, David said it's uh, what we call the official portal for European data. What does this mean in practice? Um, we have uh, data from the EU, um, from national, local, regional, also some international organizations. 
And we also collect data from uh, geo portals. Um, when I say data.europa.eu, you think, of course, at first view at data. But we are more than that. It's not just a data hub. We really try to connect um, data with information, with knowledge. And throughout the presentation, you will see how data.europa is serving this triple need. Um, so let's start with the data part. If you come to the homepage, you see immediately that you can um, do a search from there, very basically with some simple keywords or by team. Now, if you want to do it a bit more advanced, you can go here on top to the data tab and then to the data sets. And there you see you can, as David mentioned for data.gov, you can also here filter by a map. You can use also all kinds of other filters. So for example, if you only want to see the check data, you can do it here. Or you can start from the full list. And as you see, here it's even worse than in the US. We don't have like 350,000. We have almost 1.4 million data sets. I think even for experts like you, it's almost unworkable. So you can do a search or filter, as I said. Now, seeing the other speakers and the invitation to go and beauty, visit beautiful cities, let's see what we have about or published by Dublin. There you get. 2,000, almost 3,000. If you still find it too much, you can, of course, narrow down by using the filters. Um, with the list you get, you see immediately there is a title, a short description, all the formats available, uh, and the publisher. Let's now have a detailed look. If you want to go to the data, you just click on the title and there you will see that you can download um, all the formats that are available. Um, you also find some additional information. Sometimes you can immediately visualize the data on a map, for example. It depends a bit on the type of data sets uh, and the formats that we have. So if you want to really follow, find out how to find your way around in Dublin, or maybe even develop a little uh, app with giving some walks uh, or so, you can go here and, for example, download the JSON data. You can always also do it in a link data format, like a triple store. Um, from this uh, um, page, you can also do a couple of extra things. And that is, for example, checking the quality of the metadata. Um, when you go here, um, you see how good the metadata quality is. And look, maybe you can pass this to the city of uh, Dublin, the council who provided us this data, because unfortunately, the data may be very good, but the metadata quality is not top yet. And the fact that it has often 0%, if you hover over this info uh, button, you will see that it's just because this value was not provided. Now, I wouldn't care too much about the uh, metadata quality. This is mainly important to make the data sets findable. But um, we, as data.europa, what we do is we aggregate data. We um, describe them in a standardized way with standardized metadata so that you can easily access them. But the data themselves, they're si still sitting in Dublin and I'm sure people there take very good care of them and that you reach the top quality when you download the data themselves. And Finn, uh, look, there's no, but you don't have to say no, just do yes. Um, then you can also, uh, from here, download the link data format of the metadata. You can also download this um, quality assessment in linked open data if it would ever be useful. And what I find quite useful, especially um, when speaking to a researcher, for example, 
or a student is that you can immediately uh, generate a standard citation in different formats. So that was very quickly about data. But how do we connect this data now with information? Well, with data.europa.eu, we aim to also provide all kinds of content around open data. And to find this content, you can just scroll down on the homepage where you see that we share news, we re regularly carry out studies ourselves. And for that, we work together with the best experts in the field. Um, you can have a list of events and we publish some data stories. If you want to find more, you just click on more and you will find the full list. These are just the most recent one. If you miss to find this information immediately on the homepage, you can also use the tabs on top. So for studies, then you can find all the studies. In news, you can find the data stories, for example. Also, the events, which you will see, is in the format of a calendar. Um, and this brings us to the last uh, function of data.europa, and that is being a knowledge hub. And to this uh, aim, we host the data.europa academy. So you can see it as a real campus on open data where you can access all kinds of courses and learning material um, on topics in the field. So we constantly add courses and we also constantly enrich them. For the moment being, we have 26 um, courses with different modules inside. For example, um, Last, no, two weeks ago, we hosted a training course on um, improving data and metadata quality. If you are curious, you can just go to this course. You see an outline of what was discussed in the webinar, but you can also, if you missed it, still find all the reading material that was shared and developed, also the slides. And if you have some time, you can even watch back the recording. Um, I would welcome you to explore this academy. If you see that any topic is missing you're interested in or you have feedback, not only on the academy, but on everything related to the site, feedback, questions, suggestions, ideas, we really welcome you to contact us. And you can do this through this contact form. Uh, where you can also, for example, uh, propose your data sets to be uh, harvested. So this brings me already to the end of this short round. Um, and then before we close, I still have a little announcement. And then our team, we um, also take care of organizing regularly what we call outreach events. So. We organize an event to get in touch with potential interested people in open data, to spread the message, to show the value of open data. And one of our flagship events is the yearly EU uh, Datathon. And with this, I warmly would like to invite you uh, to join it. Um, the Datathon is um, a yearly competition organized by the publications office this year for the sixth time. Um, and the way it works is that we invite people, anyone uh, who has an idea to develop an application using open data around one of the four challenges listed on the website. So this year we have the European Green Deal, two challenges around um, public procurement and, and tenders and, and uh, public contracts, and one about uh, making Europe fit for a digital age. So if you think you can help us with this, you can inspire people in and outside Europe, and you don't want to miss your chance for international exposure of your ID, submitted by the 20, uh, 31st of uh, March, you still have a couple of weeks. You can use this, do this by uh, filling out a form. The good news is if you are selected, you have until October 
to de develop your app more or your ID more into an app. And when you make it to the finals, you can uh, win up to 25,000 uh, euros for uh, per um, application. Um, and the good news is even if you participate and you make it to the final selection, you get a consolation prize, which is also some beautiful money already. So don't miss this chance, register. If you want to understand better how it is, uh, how it works, we also host regularly webinars to explain, for example, uh, certain data sets, for example, our data around public procurement. We had already some, they are recorded and you can access them also via the data from website. So this brings me to the end. Um, with this, I um, welcome you to uh, register for our newsletter. You will also find a link on the website and uh, to follow us on social media. And um, we prepared this little presentation. It has many more slides. All the images in there are clickable. And if possible, I invite um, the um, uh, organizers or David to share it with you as participants or to publish them later. So you have it as some background material. Um, with this, I will close. I've talked enough, I think. If you have any questions, I'm all yours. And uh, you can also share them in the chat. And then David, I hand back over to you. Thanks a lot. Great, thank you very much, Els, for that introduction. Um, so now I'd like to, to proceed in the in the half hour that we have left uh, to speak to the panel as a whole. Uh, I remind the panelists that uh, please just feel free to jump in with your opinions. Uh, if you do need me to make you some space, and just wave your hand a little bit in the air, um, and I will make sure that you have an opportunity to say something. Now, to start things off, I had promised that I was going to start with Benedict, but now I've decided. Uh, Zachary, that I'm going to put you on the spot to start um, based on some of the things that Els was talk talking about. Um, now, a couple of the things that she introduced, one of them was uh, this idea of open data maturity. Uh, she mentioned the academy. So you can see that, yes, there's a data component, but there's also a component there that is about uh, engaging with the community and, and taking on a role of ensuring that uh, that the data quality is getting better, um, you know, interoperability, findability, all of these issues. Now, obviously, you have a role uh, with Open Data Week in terms of how it animates the community, but also your organization in general, how it animates the community. What, what's your view in terms of the role of this Data Week, the portal, in terms of bringing the community forward and, and helping the situation around open data? Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about in, in these classes that we ran, that we're running throughout Open Data Week, these Open Data 101 classes is sort of the origins of, of open data and how many, many of the open data programs are a decade, a bit more old, but the ideas behind the principles are, are far older. And, and really a lot of that is, the outcome of that is thinking about the, the institutions that already exist that will benefit from open data or where, where are the gaps that we could naturally fill by having more um, education and, and more outreach around open data. And Open Data Week is just one of the ways that we've attempted to do that. So um, for example, as I mentioned, these Open Data 101 classes, we, we're recruiting volunteers from different facets of, of, of our city, um, everything from public libraries to city employees um, to like existing um, community groups to have people that we train who can then teach other people about open data. So looking at those, those mechanisms and, and institutions that are already in place that already have broad reach into communities, in some cases, communities that we would not interact with um, that, that aren't maybe natural consumers or you don't think of as natural consumers of open data, not, not necessarily like technology companies or data analysts. Um, so, so really thinking about where, where you have existing or where we have um, existing networks. Another really good example of this is um, looking at the, the way New York City is divided. Um, one of the institutions that we have are these community boards. Their city is split up into 59 of them. And um, how can we reach the members of those different community boards and, and these like 
open data education sessions is, is one of the ways that we've we've done that. Um, the more we can take this information and, and share it with people and, and really make it accessible to them um, through through events like this, through these open data 101 education sessions that we've had, um, the the more we can we can have people um, participating in this conversation around around ultimately what is their public data. Mm -hmm. So let me, now let me let me bring Benedict into this because it seems to me that that here you're talking about an outreach program that uh, is has a pretty wide. At the end of the day, you're talking about reaching 59 communities and reaching people that you traditionally don't reach. Um, whereas Benedict, I know uh, in conversations that we've had that that you have a view around targeting and collecting open data that it should specifically be like a very, very focused, and that you believe that it should be collected for policymakers specifically, that we're collecting open data, it tends to come from the public sector, and as such, it can be used for public sector activities. Can you maybe expand on that view for us? Yeah, well, definitely. Uh, well, what I found out within the open data, I've been like for eight years with open data, I've been in charge in opening the, the Ministry of Open Data, the Finance Data, Ministry of Finance, and uh, throughout those years, I found out that one of the biggest user of open data is public sector itself, actually. Because what, what, what happens when you try to digitize the public sector's agendas, we're working with, with the different old information systems in, in, in public sectors, uh, is like those data are not good, those, those data are collected for some kind of purposes. And, and opening all of them just doesn't make any sense, like open all of the data. I, I really like your introduction. If you take a look at data.europe.eu, that you, you will see that there is around 1.4 million of data sets. From them, uh, actually 3,050, 3,000 and now 350,000 of them are from Czech Republic, actually. Um, but I don't think that's good. I don't think that's good uh, because if you would take a look, if you would take a deeper insight in, in those data sets, you would find out that probably like 80% of them are not usable for anything. And, and, and the government spent a lot of time and a lot of, lot of money, actually, a lot of effort on making those data publicly available. Although the most important systems, and the most important data are still not open in a way we want them to be open. Uh, what we do in, in, in our project is we have, I, I'm, I'm running a team of 20 data developers and, and consultants and data analysts. And we're working with open data, we're creating open data and we're working for the city decision makers. And we started actually with open data. We started, okay, let's make the data open and it will be our goal. Our goal. That's not a good goal, actually. It's, it's open data shouldn't be a goal or shouldn't be a metric that says, okay, you've opened like thousands of data sets. That's really cool. That's really cool. Uh, well, it shouldn't, I think it shouldn't. And what helped a lot is uh, what was when we started to focus a lot more on B2B data services with the, with the public uh public servants actually and very often they know the specific groups the the users of their data because open data is just another interface uh it's just another way of communication so those uh, those those for example the city hall uh they're publishing like analysis the reports they are make, making public statements so they are communicating in some ways and open data is one of them and i think they just didn't have the knowledge what, what can be done with the data? How can they transform it in something that is usable in open data format with licenses and everything? And what we also do is we work with the with the with the traffic data, for example, real-time smart city data. And designing real-time open APIs can be really, really expensive and really difficult. And you need really good stakeholders. It's not, it's not that you just open the data like like exporting a CSV file. It's something totally different. And we could be actually work with one data set for one and a half year designing one API uh, that is open, that is actually, it's not open data API. API it's not, it's not defined as open data. So, but what helped a lot is if we could get the experts who understand the domains, and those are people from actually the officers, the, the public servants, uh, and, and collaborate with them. And then the ideas of how to publish really useful open data uh, the, the, there were a lot of ideas and just comes along, just like, was like that. It was like, okay, we need the data for our decisions. We need, for example, the integration with other systems, uh, other different system. It's far more complicated than creating some kind of open data. And then like, yeah, we can, we can do open data as well. It's, it's like byproduct of, of what we do. So I think 
the most, the biggest mistake we have learned is that the open data is not a goal or there is service. We have to think about, about services and, and data, like providing data as a service, it's something different than just publishing the data that we have in, in some data warehouse. So that, that, does it make sense? Well, maybe it does. Absolutely. And, and maybe, uh, Diana, I can bring you in here because obviously uh, there's lots of preparations going on right now for, for the Olympics that will be taking place in Paris. Um, and, and then you're coming into a situation thinking about data and open data where you have a particular problem in mind, the way that Benedict is describing it here, that it's like, okay, I need, I need, we need to address additional cycling lanes and we need to see how people are transporting. So the, the way that things are happening is not uh, just throwing stuff out there and seeing what happens, but rather the other way around, the way Benedict is describing it, to say, okay, here's the problem I need to solve. We'll open data, do it. Um, yeah. So the question I would have for you is also, uh, well, for the problems, maybe you could briefly describe some of the issues that you're thinking about uh, and, and we're working with the city of Paris right now and, and how open data can and cannot solve the problems that you're looking uh, to address. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, well, in Paris, we have um, quite a long-term data policy uh, because uh, a few years ago, uh, maybe in 2015, we decided to, uh, to take um, a, lot, a lot of data, a lot of data sets uh, free. So we created the Paris Data Platform, uh, which actually um, open uh, like entire sets on data, on mobility, the, the tree that was planted, um, the situation um, of the garbage collectors, like things like that, uh, that were used by both the administration uh, and the intern technology teams, but also uh, by our partners. So um, we had this Paris data uh, platform, which was uh, just taking live. And, and yeah, it took a lot of time to understand how we could better uh, release data sets and make everyone work together on that. So um, quite a lot of activities had uh, were uh, actually uh, had their roots uh, planted inside this Paris data platform. Um, so uh, for, the, for, for the second uh, mandate of the mayor, um, the question that we had um, considering had nothing to do, well, not were quite different from this first wave of like openness of everything quite indistinctly. And we were eager to understand um, why uh, this open data strategy wasn't actually uh, uh, translating into uh, new applications, new activities and new partnerships. What we were working on and uh, also the, the state and the French government had been working on it for a long time is um, on data that we consider being, uh, consider being of general interest, of public interest. I don't know if you have this kind of uh, terminology, but the idea behind that is that a lot of data is actually <clears throat> privately held by platforms. For example, just, just one example is uh, the data of uh, Uber or other, tax, other taxi uh, companies that know exactly how many cars there are in such street or in such district at a certain time. So they have a lot of information and insights on what's going uh, on in the streets of Paris that we can't have. So um, the, the question we were asking is how we can work around this very specific sets of data uh, with the privately held by companies that we consider as being public interest data. So there was uh, a law uh, that was general, like in France, uh, that was quite, a, I think, a moderate way of finding a middle ground uh, and certain contracts, public contracts, automatically had some um, clauses on data, sh data sharing by private platforms and companies with the public person or the institution that was actually contracting with them. And we also uh, tried to have this uh, kind of um, uh, contracts with uh, when we were renewing contracts with companies on property, for example, or like 
optimization of um, of light, of electricity, of uh, consumption, electricity and energy consumption in inside the city. Of course, <clears throat> that was this second stage was really critical for us to have this very specific and limited set of data being shared. But of course, today we not we we didn't manage what well, we haven't managed yet. I would say to uh, find a way of working and operating with some companies. I'm thinking about Airbnb, of course, for example. And it's quite critical for us because uh, just the accommodation uh, and the accommodation prices in Paris is a tremendous issue. Uh, are, you, know, you know, I think that all the cities know that we have empty apartments that are being sublet on Airbnb and people who can't actually find an accommodation in Paris. So uh, this is quite critical or like more specifically, as you were, I was telling David, of course, is uh, the mobility because um, maybe you, you, you just you, you, you heard about that. We, we have quite an ambitious uh, mobility policy with reducing cars and reducing car circulation in the streets. And in the future, in, in the next future, we have some districts and zones in Paris with l really limited traffic. But we need to understand how this limited traffic would not actually be limited to people who need to go to the zone. For example, people with uh, reduced mobility, elderly people, people with kids, professionals, etc. So how do we have access uh, to this data and how after that we adapt uh, such applications like uh, Google Maps or Waze uh, to uh, apply, actually, to implement this policy that had been working worked on by by the city. So this is uh, some like of of the few challenges we are facing now, and why I wanted to uh, to say maybe the 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 main inside the you know the the bottom line is that. You just can't do that by a general law or like uh, something like general contract that has been that would be applied to any kind of uh, relationship that you have with companies. You really have to work on it personally. Uh, so uh, in two two person A, as we say in France, uh, like working with each company to understand what they need from uh, from the the, the the city and what we can bring them to better work in the city. But at the same time, they also need to be opening some data at one point because that's what we need to be able to uh, yeah to just to to conduct public policies in such sectors as accommodation policy mobility, reduce mobility policies, et cetera. Great. I mean, so it really strikes me here. So we've had uh, sort of uh, Benedict come in and say, okay, this is about, you know, we have specific questions that need to be answered. And so we target open data that way. And then you've taken it one step further even and said, okay, well, we have opened, we have specific questions as well. So you seem to be in line, but at the same time, open data needs to be supplemented with other data sets, which makes it an even more complicated story in terms of who you're targeting, because now all of a sudden you're targeting the open data that you want to give to developers to work on something. Of course, because it's, it's data. It. Sorry, it's, it's no. data. It's not really open data. It's like uh, data open to some particular persons and a particular situation and particular data sets. So it's not like Every, every data they have, we couldn't be able, even be able to work on that because we really need something very specific. So this is where actually uh, the open data policy, which was really great to start everything, now it's not exactly the appropriate tool for, for what we need to do. But um, it just applied uh, to, um, it, it, like, it, 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 it works when you apply it to, to the mobility sector. But at the same time, when you talk about, for example, the trees planting, or uh, everything that is uh, that is related to green Paris or um, garbage management, the, the citizens of of the of the city of Paris they want to access to more data. So we're still in the first stage of this open data policy because we done we we didn't like build the exact data sets that would allow us to share this data in a comprehensive, clear, transparent, but at the same time. Um, uh, you know, relevant way with uh, citizens, not just like 
big amounts of data that no one could actually use and understand. So this is a different logic. First, you have something that is like B2C, and here you have really to build your framework and think about what what do the citizens need. So you don't just like like overwhelm them with uh, use, useless information. And you have um, uh, in parallel this uh, uh, work, work work that is going on with platforms about companies because you have to like, to build new services that require specific sets of data. But these sets of data will not be like generally open to everyone. Uh, they just just be specifically used, and it was like more bilateral relationships, m- m- like more than uh, multilateral lateral like was that was the case with Paris Data Platform. <laughs> So look, I, I want to. This helps, but yeah. Oh, it's good. It's all good. all all feed for our brains to 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 process. But uh, I want to give Luke a chance to to jump in. Um. So I I, I can either leave it open for you, so I, to to just comment in general on what has been said, but I, I will also introduce a specific question, and then you can decide which way you want to go. Um, because I'm aware that that one of the things you're particularly proud of is this active travel challenge. Uh. Which, which I'll ask you to, to briefly explain to the audience. Um, but in the context of this discussion, what I'm curious about is who was the initiator of, of, of this initiative, right? Did it come centrally from a portal of some kind that, that was being driven and said, okay, this is something that we need to do. And then they went out and find open data or was it somebody in the community that came and said, oh, I saw this data on the open data portal. And I think this is a great use for it. And then they came to you and said, hey, we'd like to do this, can we? Thanks, David. Yes, uh, and it's great to hear everybody is grappling with the same issues and the same challenges or <laughs> that, that we are. Well, not so much great, but, but at least that, that we're not in it alone. So absolutely, when Elle searched for Dublin there and she came up with uh, two data sets, one which is relatively high quality and relatively up to date, right next to one from 2013 with all the wrong metadata and so forth. So how to filter all that, how to bring it up, uh, the, the ones which are most relevant and the people want to see it and which are of value to them. So we, uh, as I said before, and as you introduced me as, uh, uh, we're a local authority initiative with the four Dublin local authorities that we primarily publish local authority data. So all that's been talked about by Diana and everybody else, the bins, the tree planting, all that kind of thing. Um, but what we thought to do was perhaps try and do it in a, in, in a slightly structured way where we'd look at what we've published already, we'd try to update that, and we'd look to what we could publish new within a particular theme. So maybe transport first and then environment and so forth. So having published this as open data, we have no idea who's using it or, or for what or, 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 or whether it is of value or not. Uh, so that's kind of the, the background to the Active Travel Challenge. We just published this data from the, the, the transport service, things like bike lanes or bike parking or pedestrian counts or real-time bike share availability. And we wanted to know who was using it for, for what or how could it be used, in fact. So that's why we put together this active travel challenge. It was an active travel open data challenge. We said, look, these are our recently published data sets. Um, How are you using them? Or how would you use them? Or how could you use them? And we really put the word out there uh, as far as we could. We used all the networks that we could and uh, anybody and everybody to get the word out. Unfortunately, we got a good number of proposals back. We had about 40 proposals, which we whittled down to, to 12 participating projects. And these are all using uh, our open data to support and promote active travel, walking and cycling. We give them a good deal of time to develop their applications and tools. They had about two months with which to do this. And then at the end, we awarded prizes to, to, to the top three. So I'll just uh, give a very quick example of the type of applications that came through. So number one was my 15-minute city. You just drop a pin on the map and it'll tell you all the things you could do, you could see, and experience within a five or 10 or a 15 minute walk or cycle using isochrones. The second one was called active travel to school. And that used um, the survey data, the, the, the census data to show the neighborhoods where people weren't actively traveling to school. It then brought up the local schools. And then you could see that, okay, there's a school, it's, it's just 500 meters away. And yet people aren't actually traveling to school, why? And then you zoom in and you see that actually to get there, it's a very very circuitous two and a half kilometer drive to get there. 
But if we just put in a little intervention, maybe a gate here, pedestrian crossing there, we could turn that two kilometer drive into a 500 meter walk. So that was useful for, for planners and, uh, um, uh, you know, city planners, active travel planners and so forth. And then finally, the third one was called um, DublinBikeParking.com. That was already existing. It did show some of the parking in Dublin uh, city and region, but they updated it with new uh, bike parking data. And then they put in the real time bike share availability from the three bike share providers. So we have three bike share providers and part of the license for their bike share is that they do share the data. So, so that's, uh, I suppose, a bit like yourselves in Paris, Diana, that's one example of how we were able to access that data. So instead of going to each app separately, the user can just go to this one location, DublinBikeParking.com, and they can see which is the nearest of the three in one place. So we were, I suppose, uh, we, we were pretty much blown away by what came back from the open data that we put up. We were really expecting uh, the level of, of, of quality and innovation that we got back. And uh, we, we were very happily surprised by it. So on foot of that, we're going to organize another challenge and uh, we'll be calling it the Climate Action Challenge. We hope to launch presently, perhaps uh, uh, the, the start of April or, or the end of March. And this is all to do with Dublin as well. So if anybody out there has any ideas around using climate related open data for, for Ireland and, and for Dublin in particular to promote climate action. Well, uh, that will be in place uh, early next month to be launching. And then the beauty of it is that rather than your standard hackathon or datathon, people will have a good deal of time, a couple of months to work on their projects and hopefully come out with something of value at the end. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to, to talk a little bit about that. I'll, I'll hand back to you now, David. I don't want to take up too much of your time. All good, all good. And it, so I'm going to circle back to Zachary now. Uh, and I see we have one comment in uh, that I will address in a minute, uh, in the few minutes we have left. But what I find really interesting and what strikes me is so El, in Elsa's presentation about the, the, the 2022 event, there were four topics, right? It was about reaching out at a very general level and saying, yeah, but here, here are the problems that we want to solve. And it seems to me Luke, for you as well, that it, there was a specific topic that you went out with, and then let's see what kind of innovation happens in the community. But if I compare that, Zachary, to the way that you described the way that you're reaching out right now, you identified very particular groups that you were reaching out to, not with a particular challenge or problem to solve, but rather to say, no, no, no what we're doing is engaging with a community. And it seems to me that's a very different way of, of, of reaching out. So maybe, can you comment on that? Is there a reason why you've chosen that way? Or is there an element of we've gone to a community and we have a particular problem for them to solve? I think it's a bit of both. Um, we definitely, from our perspective, as the, the citywide open data organization, um, want to make sure that we're making the information accessible, as I mentioned, to as many New Yorkers as we can. And, and oftentimes that means reaching communities that we may not be reaching otherwise. But we also, and I think this gets a lot to Benedict's point about how do we make open data successful? Um, and it is really like focusing on on, on city employees and, and city decision makers um, as a core constituency here as well. And, and one of the things that we have is we have a network of, of city staff from each city agency uh, who are responsible for publishing data. And often these are people with analytics or data roles. So not only are they uh, people who publish data, but they're also consumers of open data. And, and each of those agencies have specific problems that they are charged with solving. And oftentimes, um, and we have some of these during Open Data Week as well, where an agency will have a particular group or problem or challenge that they are then advancing. So there's both the global perspective from as far as we're concerned, but there's also the, the narrower domain perspectives and, and really trying to blend those two because we, we, we are... Um, we have we have one perspective, but there 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 are so many different problems to solve that, that it, there it does take a lot of different uh, experts to to help to guide that and 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 to figure out what those what those areas might be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Els, you have your hand up. Yeah. I really love to listen to your use cases and especially the one of Luke. It it sounds familiar. Um, so I'm definitely curious to find out more about it. And what I see um, as that we have all in common is that there are um, different angles to approach the problem or the challenge, and that is 
all by team, all by community. But in the end, what we all do with from whatever angle we come, we try to get in touch with the users, um, get feedback from them to make our data really open. Because it's a very fair point that many of you made that just providing long lists of open data is not making them open and, and not making them usable mainly. Uh, so thanks for the inspiration of the others. Great. Uh, we're right at six o'clock local, well, sorry, noon local time, six o'clock our time, which means that we're pretty close to the end. I see Luke has, has uh, added a link that everybody can look at for the active travel challenge, which I can definitely highly recommend. Um, Jeff makes a comment. I will read it out because I'm not sure if the recording uh notes the fact of whatever is in the note, but he he points out that it's important for open data to establish and control the metadata keys that allows outside data to join. I see I see a lot of nodding. So Jeff, we the panel agrees with you. Uh, it seems to me. Yes, I've got and now I've got everybody smiling, so that's good. Um, given the time, uh, I, I always hate it when things go too long. So uh, even though I have about a hundred questions more on my list here, I will wrap things up. And I'd like to really thank, first of all, uh, all of the speakers and panelists that came today, it took the time out to, to give their opinion. Sorry that we didn't have more space and more time. We could talk for hours. I'm sure. Thank you very much to everybody in the audience that that took the time away. I know after two years of sitting at home and doing online events, sometimes it can be a bit much, um, but we hope that that you got something out of this today and we thank you. If you'd like Elsa's presentation, please reach out to us. Um, and yeah, let's just keep engaging with one another and, and driving open data. Thank you very much and, and enjoy your lunch. And in, for all of us in Europe, enjoy your dinner. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye. All the best. See you.